Hey guys, National Master James Canty III here with Chess.com, and today we have Member Game Analysis. Now before we get started, make sure you click on the link under the video right now. Submit some of your games so that hopefully we can choose a few for some Member Game Analysis. So we worked hard on today's study so that you guys can learn something today, and hopefully you do. Now, this is what we're going to talk about today. Number one is going to be Peace, Health, and Futures. You want to make sure that, of course, your pieces are healthy, just like any sports team player. If you have healthy pieces, you should have a healthy game and et cetera. What's the future of that piece? What's the future of that team member on the team? So that's number one. Number two is going to be keep development going. You can't just stop development because later on it should hurt you. You know, small problems always become bigger ones later. So you want to make sure you keep that development going. And then number three is going to be don't give your opponent the obvious. Don't give them something that, that you know that they want, that you know that you would want if you were in, they, in their shoes. So we're going to talk about those today. And today's member is Ed Vetter, Ed Vetter 758. So shout out to you, Ed Vetter. We chose your game and we're going to go over it. So in this game, you actually played a Fide Master. So kudos to you. And you actually played a very good game. So we're going to dive into this, guys. And Ed Vetter 758 had the black pieces here. So let's see what happens. We have a French defense, one of my favorite openings. I grew up playing this. Now I play the Sicilian, but I am I love the French. The French is very strong. I even play it a lot just as a, a way to get away from the Sicilian sometimes. French is very, very strong, and I highly recommend the opening. D4 and D5, very nice here. And what this is about is just having a nice center. You want to have your own stake in the center. So white is like, yeah, I have two pawns in the center. And black is like, why well, at least have one, which is at least okay. That's very good. And if you take this one, then I'm going to have another pawn in the center and be perfectly fine. The problem with the French is that if you ever heard of it, it's called the French bishop quotation marks what that means is that the bishop is bad and it's going to be bad because these pawns are locking the bishop in so a lot of times you would see maybe b6 and bishop a6 getting rid of our bad bishop for white's good one or you would go maybe bishop d7 and just kind of sit here for a while and see what happens but in this game we played a6 very interesting i have seen it before following up with b5 or stopping anything from coming to b5 as well we have knight to f3 a very common move Bishop to b4, these are one of the standard moves in the game. Pretty good stuff there. Now, e5. e5 is very, very nice. He's pushing past. We're going to go c5, which is the game move. That's exactly what black played here. Good stuff. a3, bishop takes, and pawn takes. And now, after this move, we're going to look at black's position and say, okay, number one, what is the piece health? And um, what's the future of our pieces here? So after black makes this, this next move here, c4, you have to think about the future of your pieces and which which piece do you think is going to be the absolute worst piece here for black i'll give you a second absolutely the bishop if you thought it was this bishop you are 100 percent correct this bishop is going to be very very bad it almost never has a future which means you have to get it outside of the pawn chain somehow some way which is going to take probably a very long time to get this bishop out of this um, lockdown that he's on here. And white's doing quite well. I mean, both bishops are pretty good. He could probably do this one here. Put the bishop on e2. He's doing okay. Half open file for the rook. It's pretty hard. It's pretty harsh for black here because it's a very cramped position to say the least here. So instead, maybe pawn takes d4 or not taking it at all. Maybe playing knight e7 right now or b6 or anything else or pawn takes d4. What about pawn takes? Yes, will we undouble his pawns? Yeah, but my, my bishop now has some type of future. And maybe I can even put a bishop here and put and bully this pawn if I'm able to get this rook over here to keep some pressure going. A lot of things can happen, but we have to make sure that we think about the future of our pieces. We have to think about the health of our pieces. Just like any team member, if you play sports, basketball, soccer, tennis, anything, if they're not well, if that player is not well, they're not going to do good. And that's exactly how it is in chess the same way. C4, this player is not good, which means this game could not probably be as good as you think it would be or as good as you want it to be because of the fact that um, this piece is very bad. So finishing up, bishop to e2, knight e7. We just keep the development going. Knight e7 is time to castle. Very well. Castles and castles. Knight to e1, 
this move is very, very interesting. You're like, what is this move about? Well, I always like to say when you castle this game time. So once the king is castled this game time, he's going for F4, F5 stuff. G4, trying to mate this king quickly. When black should be trying to counter with like F5, try to figure out what to do with these pieces and hopefully have a great game. Now we played knight to g6, very nice move. Just getting the knight to a better square and um, making sure that the position stays active as much as he can. F4, there it is. F4 is on the board and we follow up with F5. Now another pawn, once again, on the light square is here. But if he doesn't take this pawn, then this is going to be pretty solid for black because there's no way to break through for white. And if you don't have a breakthrough, it probably won't work. So he did capture his, this en passant. Black takes, queen takes f6, and then g3, defending his pawn. So this is a very closed position, to say the least. What do you prefer in closed positions, bishops or knights? If you said knights, then you're 100% correct. Knights are the ones that can maneuver and jump over pieces and stuff, and you can have a very good game. So, And white only has one knight, but black has two, so maybe we can do some maneuvering around here and probably get this knight to a very, very, very good square and uh, figure out what to do. Maybe we could play b5 and put this bishop to work on b7, put this knight on c6, and maneuver it around all the way to the e4 square, where the bishop is helping the knight on the e4 square here. Very long-term plan, but you got to think about these kind of things, especially in the closed games like this one. Knight to c6, there it is, and then knight to f3. He's going for e5. We call that a permanent outpost. He has 100% control over this square. So we have to figure out what to do. And this leads us to our second point. Number two is keep development going. So instead of queen f5, which virtually kind of doesn't do anything, you want to make sure that every move has a very big and good attention to it. Not just any in intention, but a pretty good intention. Queen f5, I'm not sure what this is about. Maybe queen h3, but you need more than just one piece, the queen sitting over there to scare the king. It won't work. You actually have to make sure you keep your development going. I always ask myself, what haven't I moved yet? Especially in these kind of positions where it's like, it's tough, or I'm not figuring out what's going on, or like, what do I actually do here? Well, what haven't I moved yet? Oh, this bishop. Well, you know what? I could go bishop d7, but then let's go back to, to step number one again, which is like the health of the pieces. Well, what if he does go knight e5? I kind of don't want to take this. Maybe I could, but if I don't, I could go bishop e8. Well, what's about bishop e8? This seems like a weird move. Well, let's just say hypothetically he takes this knight, and then we take with the bishop. Whoa, look at that. It went from c8 to g6. This bishop now has life once again. And also on bishop to e4, we're feeling really, really, really good now as black because this bad bishop is not bad anymore. And we now have a future for the bishop there. So keep the development going. It would have been much better to play bishop e7 as opposed to queen f5. So queen f5 was played, knight e5, knight takes pawn, or knight takes knight, pawn takes, queen g6. And you see what happens when you're not developed. Stuff like this starts to happen like... These guys are over here doing what? And the crickets start now. We don't know because uh, the pieces aren't out. So we have to make sure that everything's out. He plays H or A A4, which is a very nice move. Getting his piece active on a very active square here. Again, you could probably just go bishop to D7. And bishop D7 after bishop check, we step out of the way. Threatening not to move the rook right now because both of these squares will be bad. If I go rook to E8... Well, there's a skewer. Ouch. That's going to hurt. Picking up the rook. Or if I go here, he just takes it. Another ouch. Man. So we really can't do much right now. But the fact is that this rook is now able to move and be a little bit more mobile than it was before. And then in the game, we actually played knight to e7. After bishop here, this king is now tied here. And we don't want to stay here. Of course, king f7 just loses on the spot. Not something that we want to do. And then uh, king e8 gets us in trouble. So you move the queen out of the way because king e8 would have been the same fate here. And then he plays bishop f3. Luckily, he didn't play queen d2 to try to cut you off completely and swing the rook over because that would have been devastating. If queen to d2, rook f1 is coming and uh, it's some issues. It's some very big issues for, for the black pieces here. Queen e4, bishop f3. Queen e3 check. What a move. Very nice. You found an in-between move. That's really nice. You actually found some very good counterplay here. And I'm very proud to say that you found some, some good counterplay. Queen takes c3, queen f1, and then you play queen takes c2 because that's a check. Got to respond to check first. And then after that, he plays king, king h3. You stepped simply out of the way. What a good move. And now, technically, you're doing quite well, if not almost winning here. 
which is crazy to say because you it was a crazy game but now you're doing well here bishop h5 check g6 is played and queen f6 whoa that's a scary move just because my piece is hanging doesn't mean I have to move it, is what he's saying here. He's also threatening this, but more importantly, he's threatening mate on the move right now. So you got to be careful. But you found this very excellent move to get rid of that pressure. Queen f5 check. Oh, yeah, that works. Bishop g4, we take the queen, pawn takes back, and then knight to f5. And then this leads us to our last point after white makes the move. Bishop takes f5. What piece would you guys take with? The g pawn or the e pawn? Which one? Which one? I'll give you a second. If you said the G pawn, then you are correct. And the G pawn, why the G pawn? In the game, in the game, Ed Vetter played E takes. E takes. And this leads us to our last point. Don't give your opponent the obvious. What is the most obvious move here for, for White? Rook to D8 check. He's going to check you. And no matter what you do, it's going to be pretty rough. Because he's going to get the 7th rank or he's just going to defend this. When I didn't have to allow this at all. So you don't want to give your opponent the obvious. Honestly, I'm not a fan of giving my opponent anything unless it's a gambit and I'm giving it up for checkmate or material. But other than that, I'm not trying to give him that anyway. So I would rather take this way. So now that it stays closed and I can just sit here and maybe develop my bishop this way. I got b5 coming. So if he makes a move like bishop e7, I don't even have to go here. I can go bishop d7 right now. Let's say he goes rook b1, hitting the b pile. Then I can push b5, and now I'm the one with the open file and two pass pawns. What just happened? I have no idea. But we exactly, we just did not give him anything obvious. We didn't give him anything. And we would have had a very good game here, which it could be a draw due to opposite color bishops. And if we can't get anything to move. But in the game, in the game, e takes e5 was played. After that, he played king h4, trying to run around this way and snag this pawn here. King f7, king g5. Now there's kind of no way unless he plays h6. b5, bishop to c5. Very nice move. Rook b8. And here is the fatal blow. Pawn takes. Check. You need to block with the rook. Rook b7. Rook a8. Threatening, oh my goodness, so much here. Especially bishop e6 is checkmate if he goes bishop e6. Rook to c7. Very nice move. Bishop here, that's a nice move as well. This king is holding down so much. And then after rook c6, check. And there's the resignation. There's so much going on here. No matter where you move, it's going to be bad for the white, for black pieces here. But I have to say, you playing a Fide Master, Ed Vetter, 7 8, you play at 7 5 8, you played a very good game. This guy's a Fide Master, which means he's 2300 Fide minimum. And you're actually, you played him until this game in game right here i think you played a very very good game and very very well underrated for that and everyone that's watching today of course we're going to recap as a summary here to talk about what happened today number one is you have to think about the piece health the health of the pieces just like any team member or any sports player you got to think about the health of the pieces and the future of the pieces that's number one and how you do that is ask yourself the question what is the future of this piece and if you can figure that out maybe you'll make instead of going you know this move, you might make a different move that gives you a better and brighter future um, in that sense. So you want to be asking that. Number two is keeping the development going. What haven't I moved yet? If you find yourself in that position like, hey, I don't know what to really do or I don't know a, a good plan here. I have a lot of students that say that and they fall into that slump sometimes where I just I don't know what to do. So I'm just going to move this. I'm just going to do that. Well, what you can do is ask yourself, what haven't I moved yet? If you figure that out, what haven't I moved yet? then you're probably on to something. You're going, oh, I can get this piece out. My last rook can come to the center now and have a better game. So things like that, make sure you're on top of that. And then number three is don't give your opponent obvious stuff. You cannot give him that. And you want to ask yourself, you know, where is he going to go next? After he moves or after you move, where is he going to go next? So just like in this game, E takes F5. Rook to D8 is, is just common. We know he has to go Rook D8 check. And now, of course, he didn't in this game. In this game, or Rook E1, sorry, Rook E1 check. But he did in this game. He played King H4 and King G5, which is a little bit different. But the idea is that you don't, want, you don't want to give them anything. I'm not a fan of giving my opponents anything. And that's just how it goes. So thank you guys for hanging out today. Ed, uh, Ed's, Ed Vetter, 758, you played very, very good here. And I hope to see more of your games, of course, as well. Hey, make sure you guys... Click on the link below, submit your videos, uh, submit your games so that make sure that we can um, 
analyze them for you and hopefully you can get some member game analysis going i'm national master james canty the third thank you so much for hanging out with us and i will see you on the next one